I'm on the wireless mic. No. Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, it's 8 o'clock. I know there's a giant crowd in the, in the uh, back hall there. Uh, they'll be coming in. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. And a couple of announcements uh, before I let uh, Dr. Saad introduce the guest speaker. Um, uh, first of all, um, as if he did not have enough awards, I don't know if this was announced last week or whatever, but Roberto Boli won yet another award um, from the Commonwealth of Kentucky for his achievements in uh, cardiovascular disease and the impact um, on this state. Uh, today's topic is pulmonary hypertension. And uh, in trying to look up, do I know anybody who's ever had pulmonary hypertension? Actually, there was only one celebrity that I could come up with, and that was Natalie Cole. Um, um, so I remember when I was in training, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension was one that we dreaded uh, because we had nothing to do for it at all. Um, but uh, hopefully today, our guest speaker will tell us something different. To introduce him, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Mohammed Saad, who is the chief of the division of pulmonary uh, medicine, sleep, critical care, and a few other things. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Uh, Al Kurdish, who's on one of our faculty. Uh, just briefly to tell you about him, he uh, did his medical school back in Egypt in Minya Medical School and did his internship residency at New Jersey in Seton Hall, and joined us in 2011 uh, for a pulmonary critical care fellowship. And he stayed on for a, a sleep fellowship for another year, so he was in training with us for four years. Um, did very well, he actually served as a chief fellow uh, two years out of these four years, and received um, outstanding fellow award three times. Um, and stayed on, which was uh, really, uh, blessing for us and wanted to focus on pulmonary hypertension. Uh, he's the director of the pulmonary hypertension program um, as of last uh, July. Um, just uh, tell you how much he has been doing because some of you as president worked with him. He had uh, mentored and uh, helped a lot of our house staff for their scholarly work. Had about 33 uh, abstract, 37 manuscript. Uh, and he's only been here for two and a half years, so it's outstanding what he's doing. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have him um, working with us and helping, of course, developing our pulmonary hypertension program. Now, the topic is, in my opinion, is really very important for general internists because the field has changed dramatically in the last few years with the classifications and new drugs and Kareem is gonna to touch on that and help you to uh, understand the new things in pulmonary hypertension field. Um, thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Dr. Sa. Uh, today we'll talk about pulmonary hypertension. We'll touch base uh, on different uh, uh, key points. Uh, we will discuss definition, classification of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we will talk about definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, we will talk about pathophysiology, pathology uh, diagnosis. Uh, we will present uh, a few complex uh, cases uh, to illustrate management in, in complex uh, situation. Uh, we will discuss treatment and finally uh, prognosis. We'll start first with definition. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is uh, defined by increase in the mean pulmonary artery pressure to a number of 25 millimeter mercury or more uh, by right heart cath uh, during rest. The definition of exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension uh, was removed uh, because we don't know what is a, a physiological uh, uh, maximum uh, level of pulmonary hypertension induced by uh, exercise. We still use 25 number as a cutoff for diagnosis despite we know uh, physiologically our mean pulmonary uh, artery pressure is much less. Our normal mean pulmonary artery pressure is around 14 millimeter mercury. Upper limit of normal is 20. This 25 number is based on consensus opinion, and the last guidelines mentioned that the number between 21 and 24, which is considered supraphysiological, uh, uh, the significance of that number is unclear. But since the publication of these guidelines, a uh, couple of studies investigated uh, this definition and uh, looked into that category, which 
sometimes we refer to as borderline pulmonary artery pressure. This was a retrospective study from the VA system, looked at uh, about 22,000 uh, right heart cath, and there was a significant uh, uh, period for follow-up, about 900 days. They looked at mortality, and they found that there is increase in mortality once your mean pulmonary artery pressure goes above 19 millimeter mercury, which is physiologically sound. So this group of patients with borderline pressure are at high risk of mortality. These findings uh, were replicated with another study uh, published recently from Vanderbilt, looked at 4,000 right heart cath, and they found similar things. If your mean pulmonary artery pressure in that borderline range, you have increased mortality, and even the increase in mortality started at a lower number of 11 millimeter mercury. After your mean pulmonary artery pressure exceeds that number, there is gradual increase in uh, mortality. This group had higher female uh, younger patients and more uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension or group one pulmonary uh, hypertension. <coughs> These two studies highlight uh, the importance of a uh, uh, possible update uh, in the definition uh, of pulmonary hypertension because a lot of time you do right heart cath and you have this borderline uh, number. We know that these patients at a higher risk uh, possibly for progressing to pulmonary hypertension, higher risk for mortality, but you still cannot treat them because they are not pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension by uh, definition. So the, the, the definition of pulmonary uh, hypertension is evolving and, and that might uh, uh, change based on uh, uh, upcoming uh, studies. Classification, uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, has five groups. Group one, which we refer to as pulmonary arterial hypertension or w WHO group one. Uh, group two, uh, secondary two, left heart disease. Group three, secondary two, lung disease hypoxia. Group four, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary uh, hypertension. And finally, group five, which include uh, different uh, uh, miscellaneous uh, causes. Today, we will just focus on group one. We talked about the definition of pulmonary hypertension, but pulmonary arterial hypertension is a subgroup, which is group one. So when you say pulmonary arterial hypertension, I understand you refer to group one. Pulmonary hypertension is all the five groups. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, beside the increase in the main pulmonary artery pressure, you have a normal wedge pressure, you have increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, so you have a pre-capillary uh, increase in pressure in absence of significant lung disease, CTIP, or other rare diseases, which basically group three, four, and five. So this is the group we will talk about today, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, subclasses include idiopathic, heritable, and uh, drug and toxins induced, and pulmonary hypertension associated with connective tissue disease, HIV, uh, portopulmonary hypertension, congenital heart disease and schistosomiasis, which is rare here. We will touch base during the talk about congenital heart disease because it has also four subclasses, Eisenmenger syndrome, left to right shunt, a coincidental defect in setting uh, of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, such as small VSD or ASD, and uh, finally pulmonary hypertension after surgery, which can happen as a residual elevated pressure after correction of cardiac defect or recurrence of pulmonary hypertension after uh, surgery. Uh, when you have a shunt, you start with left to right shunt because the pressure on the left cardiac chamber is higher. And that shunt can increase over time, causing overload to the right side of the heart. And eventually, you have increased pressure and increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance and that leads to shunt reversal. Eventually, you will have right to left shunt, which is Eisenmenger uh, syndrome. And we will present uh, cases uh, highlighting the progression of uh, uh, these diseases. Epidemiology. Pulmonary hypertension is a common disease due to left heart disease and lung disease, but pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is WHO group one, still rare. The incidence is about uh, two cases per million, prevalence between 12 and 15 cases per million. And there is a more uh, female to male uh, ratio. So the disease is more common uh, in female, uh, but it has worse prognosis in male, which is known as sex paradox in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, mean age of presentation, about 50 years of age. And we see a trend uh, in diagnosing uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension 
in older age. So the NIH registry uh, from uh, uh, the late 80s, the median age was about 30 or 34. Now the median age is 50. And every day we see older patients uh, uh, presenting to us in, in the clinic. Um, the epidemiology, half of those patients mostly have idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. The other half, all of them, they have other causes. It's very important to uh, uh, take good history because about 5% of your patients will have drug or toxin exposure, and that can be the cause of your pulmonary uh, hypertension. So it is very important to take a good history and to be familiar with different medications which can uh, uh, cause pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the most common one we see, fenfluramine, but during the last couple of years, there are more studies uh, linking amphetamine and methamphetamine to development of uh, pulmonary hypertension. And based on those studies, this medication can even uh, move from likely to uh, definite uh, uh, medications in the future. Every now and then, we see new medication coming with, uh, for example, some medication used in chemotherapy uh, can induce pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, we have seen a couple of patients uh, started a new medication for multiple myeloma associated with uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. So always take a good drug history, ask about recent uh, uh, medication start, recent change in uh, medication. SSRI does not uh, cause pulmonary hypertension in the patient, but it is associated with uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension in the newborn if the mother was taking a, a selective serotonin reuptake uh, inhibitor. Uh, Pathogenesis. We have three different pathways, the nitric oxide pathway, the endothelium pathway, and the prostacyclin pathway. In the last 10 or 14 years, all the medications we have, we have new medications, but still all of these medications target one of those three uh, pathways. And eventually, if we stimulate this nitric oxide pathway or stimulate the prostacyclin pathway, you will have vasodilation, decreased proliferation. If you block the endothelium receptor pathway, you will uh, block the vasoconstriction and reduce uh, the proliferation. So very important to note also, it's not a, a process of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, but there is involvement on, uh, with, uh, uh, of the pulmonary vascular cells uh, and uh, increased proliferation, which led us to the cancer theory of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The vascular cells of the pulmonary artery uh, possess characteristics similar to cancer cells, almost all of the characters with exception of uh, invasion and uh, metastasis. And the new paradigm of treatment, we use multiple medications to target pulmonary hypertension early, similar to uh, the treatment of cancer using different uh, uh, medicines, trying to target different uh, pathways uh, uh, to treat the patient uh, uh, early. We never ask about antenatal history, uh, but there is uh, possible evidence that uh, maternal malnutrition, uh, preeclampsia, placental insufficiency, all of these factors, which is called antenatal stress factors, can lead to change in fetal programming, and that can lead to disruption of vascular uh, growth, and that can manifest later with pulmonary hypertension in different stages of life upon exposure to any of the inciting factors that can uh, precipitate eventually pulmonary uh, hypertension. It's very important to be aware about the hemodynamic progression of pulmonary hypertension. With increase in the upper load, you have increased pulmonary vascular resistance. You have a stable cardiac output at the beginning, and that starts to drop when you uh, start decompensating. With decreased cardiac output, you start having increase in the right atrial uh, pressure. And the pulmonary artery pressure, a uh, very important uh, point I want to highlight is the pressure goes up at the beginning, but when you start decompensating and having right ventricular failure, the pressure starts to drop. So you cannot use the mean pulmonary artery pressure in isolation uh, to determine prognosis or uh, to monitor a patient progression. Uh, example, if you take this point here and another point here, this is the same mean pulmonary artery pressure, but these are two different stages of disease. So if you look here, Hypothetical numbers, mean pulmonary artery pressure 40, and mean pulmonary artery pressure is 40. This patient is sicker than the first patient. This patient has reduced cardiac index, very high PVR, increased mean right atrial pressure. The mortality of this patient much higher than the first patient. I will be very concerned about patient number two. If both patients present to me 
uh, to the clinic, I will be very concerned about the second patient also, although the mean pulmonary artery pressure is the same. I may admit this patient to the hospital, start him on parenteral therapy, while this patient can uh, uh, benefit from uh, less uh, intensive therapy. Also, you incorporate that with uh, the symptoms and functional uh, class. So the take, take home point is you cannot use just the mean pulmonary artery pressure as a prognostic tool or to follow the patient. You have to look at other parameters, such as uh, the right heart function, right atrial pressure, and cardiac uh, index. With progression of pulmonary hypertension, you have increase in uh, right ventricular afterload. And eventually, uh, the right ventricle uh, evolved from uh, the normal size and uh, normal function to abnormal size and function. This is the pressure volume loop for a normal right ventricle. It, it looks like triangular or trapezoidal in shape, different from the pressure volume loop of left ventricle. This is the pressure volume loop of a, a normal left ventricle. You can see the differences. When you have increased pressure, the right ventricle starts to adapt, and it shifts to fetal programming with expression of different myosin chains from alpha to beta, increase uh, receptors, the beta adrenergic receptors, and it's, uh, to start with that, uh, uh, translate into hypertrophy, adaptation, increased systolic uh, function, and the right ventricle pressure volume loop looks like left ventricular pressure volume loop with increased contraction in the face of increased in the after load. With progression of the disease and increased pressure load on the right ventricle, you have right ventricular failure. You see the systolic elastins start to decrease, decrease systolic function, and you can see the right ventricular wall becomes thin, hypokinetic, dilated, and this is correlated with worse uh, prognosis. RD adaptation is very important uh, for prognosis, and it's one of the most prognostic uh, uh, factors in pulmonary hypertension. You can see a difference in mortality in different uh, subgroups of pulmonary hypertension. All of these subgroups are group 1, or PAH. Eisenmenger syndrome tend to have better uh, uh, outcomes than idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, and scleroderma is the worst. And all of that returns back to the right ventricle. If you look here, you find people with Eisenmenger, they have more RV hypertrophy, they have better contractility, they have less RV fibrosis, and less right ventricular diastolic stiffness. In contrast, if you look at the scleroderma patient, they have decreased RV contractility, even in a face of a lower uh, PVR. So if you take a patient with Eisenmenger syndrome and a patient with a scleroderma, you have the same uh, uh, increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance and the pressure. Patients with scleroderma tend to drop their right ventricular function earlier, and that's why we follow them closely and we treat them aggressively if you have uh, pulmonary hypertension with scleroderma because we know the prognosis is uh, worse. Remodeling happened in the pulmonary circulation and it happened in the right ventricle as well. There are differences and similarities between both of them. Some of the similarities is uh, fibrosis, uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, remodeling and mitochondrial dysfunction, and eventually metabolic transformation with glycolytic shift in both the pulmonary circulation and the right ventricle. These are picture transaxial view, uh, FDG PET scan, uh, for patients with mild pulmonary hypertension and severe pulmonary hypertension. During resting condition, the RV utilizes fatty acid more than carbohydrate. With exercise, you may have shift uh, to using carbohydrate, but if that exercise or stress in case of the pulmonary hypertension persists, you become more dependent on carbohydrate more than fatty acid, and that's clear here with increased uptake. This is the pre-war of the right ventricle. This is interventricular septum. This is a mild pH. There is no much uptake here, while in severe pulmonary hypertension, you can see increased uptake in the uh, pre-wall of the right ventricle. And this is reversible with treatment. This is a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension before treatment, and three months after epoprostenol treatment, you can see the decreased uptake which can be translated that the right ventricular metabolic pathway is recovered and started utilizing fatty acid again. It's not only utilization of carbohydrate, but the unutilized fatty acid may accumulate in the right ventricle, and that can lead to lipotoxicity, and that is one of the theories of uh, causes of right ventricular failure in advanced uh, cases of pulmonary hypertension. 
here, this is uh, 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 MRI. Uh, they looked at the concentration of the uh, triglycerides in the interventricular septum in pulmonary hypertension and control. And you can see there is increased uh, myocardial triglyceride in the interventricular septum when compared to normal individual with increased lipid peak when you compare it to uh, control. And this is one of the new uh, targets for treatment of pulmonary hypertension. There is no medication approved. But one of the targets, if you can block this fatty acid accumulation and, and this process, you may have a better right ventricular uh, uh, function, uh, which can translate into better survival uh, eventually. Moving to pathology, uh, different grades of uh, uh, pulmonary uh, vascular remodeling. Uh, Heath Edwards breathing uh, described it early in uh, 1950s, mainly in, in series of patients with a, a congenital heart uh, disease. Uh, this is a diagram uh, uh, of patients with congenital heart disease. As we mentioned, you start having left to right shunt, increased pressure, increased pulmonary vascular resistance, the shunt reverse from right to left, and you start having Eisenmenger syndrome. They described the different grades of uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling. Initially, they put grades from one to six. Uh, this was updated, and now it's grade one to four. But basically, the first three grades are reversible, and the last three grades are irreversible. You start having a, a, a medial hypertrophy, uh, intimal proliferation, and the proliferation continues until you have necrotizing arthritis or the picture of plexiform lesion. Uh, understanding this uh, pathology is important because it translates into clinical practice. When we see patients with advanced pulmonary hypertension, Usually, if you start the treating them very late, a lot of time you don't have that response you see when you start treating these patients early. And that could be related to the advancement uh, of the intimate complex lesions. And really, there is no much to vasodilate or no much to uh, uh, decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance. So it, it is very important to start the treatment early in those stages which are reversible. Diagnosis. There is marked delay in diagnosis uh, in pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension. Uh, review registry is the major US registry. About 20% of the patient had more than two uh, years of symptoms before diagnosis. This is an Australian study called the delay study. The patient reported uh, symptoms 12 months after onset of symptoms. They had average of five visits to primary care, three to five visits to pulmonology and cardiology. And finally, they have referral to uh, pulmonary hypertension, but that took about four years. So if, if we see these patients at earlier stage, we can uh, reverse the vascular remodeling earlier. Uh, we can improve survival. Uh, we can improve prognosis. And, and this is not atypical. I think this is typical, uh, although that study in, from Australia, if, if you look at different clinical trials and registries, that number is, is right. Uh, we see uh, those patients with pulmonary hypertension after they had seen multiple physicians, underwent multiple testing, received multiple diagnoses, asthma, COPD, and you do pulmonary function tests, they don't have asthma, they don't have COPD, but they had symptoms with dyspnea, and it was unexplained for three to four uh, years before uh, presentation. The most common presenting symptoms uh, is dyspnea on exertion. Uh, once uh, your uh, uh, disease progressed, you might have advancement uh, in your symptoms, uh, eventually to syncope or presyncope, which portends a poor prognosis in uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. And eventually, you can have the signs of right heart failure, such as ascites pulmonary, uh, uh, um, uh, ascites, not pulmonary edema. Uh, th these people do not develop pulmonary edema in contrast to people from left-sided heart disease. They tend to develop pulmonary edema. But our patient present with signs of right ventricular failure such as ascites and lower extremity edema. They can present with a typical symptom. This patient presented with hoarseness of voice, and she had uh, left vocal cord uh, paralysis with uh, uh, restricted mobility here in the left vocal cord. And the first test she had was CT scan to evaluate for possible cancer, uh, thinking about infiltration of uh, recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve. She was found to have enlargement of the pulmonary uh, artery, she underwent echo, found to have elevated pressure, right heart cath, her mean pulmonary artery pressure was 81. Pulmonary artery pressure 123 over 45. 
she had low cardiac index, advanced uh, uh, functional class, elevated PVR. Uh, she underwent the treatment. She is currently on uh, remodulin uh, and uh, other uh, combination or on, uh, oral uh, treatment. Uh, the last repeat right heart cath in 2017 uh, showed marked improvement in cardiac output. She is functional class one and six minute walk uh, test almost uh, normal. She is not even on oxygen. Uh, so presentation can be uh, atypical, and this is called Ortner syndrome or cardiovocal uh, syndrome uh, when you have. Uh, increase in the vascular size of blood vessel causing uh, uh, um, compression of recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve. And her voice recovered uh, as well. Diagnostic test. We use EKG, chest X-ray, uh, PFT, uh, high resolution CT, uh, uh, right heart cath with vasoreactivity testing and pulmonary angiography as part of our workup of pulmonary uh, hypertension. Usually you have the patient, signs, symptoms, you take history. Uh, most of our patients present with uh, an echo that is already uh, done. Uh, the first workup, you try to find out if that elevated pressure is secondary to left-sided heart disease or advanced lung disease, because if that's the case, you address the underlying condition uh, first. If that's not the case, you advance for a VQ scan to evaluate for CTIF, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, because this is the only group of pulmonary hypertension which is completely curable. So if you do a VQ scan and you have high probability, you advance for a pulmonary angiography, uh, which is a gold standard for diagnosing uh, CTIF. And if not, you proceed with the right heart cath, you evaluate your hemodynamics, your vasoreactivity test. If you have a positive vasoreactivity test, you can start calcium channel blockers. If you have a negative vasoreactivity uh, test, uh, you uh, uh, can start other vasodilators uh, available. Also, you complete your investigation trying to find what is the cause of the pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is group one. So HIV testing, connective tissue disease, uh, make sure the patient doesn't have a liver disease, and uh, uh, take a good uh, uh, previous drug uh, history to subclassify uh, group one. In, in some cases, it can, it can be tricky. The patient uh, uh, can have uh, underlying lung disease or underlying heart disease. And, and we have to figure out, is that a cause of pulmonary hypertension or it is a comorbid condition? A lot of patients in Kentucky, they have COPD. So it's not uncommon to have a patient pre presenting with mild COPD as a comorbid condition while they have pulmonary arterial hypertension. But also you have to find out, is it a comorbid condition or it's just a core pulmonal due to severe COPD causing pulmonary hypertension, because the treatment is uh, completely different. EKG, uh, you can see uh, right axis uh, deviation, uh, RV strain, uh, incomplete or sometimes complete right bundle branch block, uh, increase uh, uh, P uh, wave or P pulmonal in lead uh, two. Uh, these are signs that you can see with right ventricular strain in uh, pulmonary hypertension. Chest X-ray, this is one of our patients. You can see enlargement of the pulmonary artery on both sides. Even you can see it on the lateral uh, view. Uh, chest CT, uh, dilation of the main pulmonary artery, reflux of the contrast into the hepatic vein can be noted. Uh, right atrial enlargement, right ventricular uh, enlargement, and enlargement of the inferior vena cava. You can see the size of the IVC compared to uh, the aorta. Uh, very enlarged. Very rarely you may have ectasia of the pulmonary artery with in situ thrombosis, which is very uh, uh, rare and sometimes can be confusing for an acute PE or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. But this is an example of a patient with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. The pressure was 150 over 70 with a mean pressure of 100. And uh, uh, she had uh, uh, formed a mural thrombi uh, in her pulmonary uh, artery. Echo is usually the first uh, diagnostic tool. A lot of uh, patients present with uh, cardiac echo. Uh, we uh, try to measure uh, the right ventricular uh, pressure uh, looking at the tricuspid uh, valve uh, envelope. And based on the velocity, you can use the formula to evaluate right ventricular systolic pressure or pulmonary artery systolic pressure. This can be overestimated or underestimated based on your quality of tricuspid regurg envelope. That's why sometimes we have uh, discordance between the results of the echo and the results of the right heart uh, cath. But it's not only the pressure you look at, but you look at other signs which can indicate underlying increase in the pulmonary artery pressure, such as 
uh, right ventricular enlargement. This is an echo from one of our patients. You can see right ventricular uh, uh, enlargement. You can see right atrial enlargement, uh, bowing of the septum. Even there is a, sometimes the right ventricle compress the left ventricle and that can impair the, the systolic function and sometimes the systolic function. You can see septum bounds. So the more you have uh, on the echo, the higher probability this is a case of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and also it is prognostic because it can evaluate the right ventricular size and right ventricular function, uh, which is very important in uh, prognosis. VQ scan. VQ scan is very important test uh, and very important part of the workup of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Even if the patient had a CTPE protocol and it's negative, it doesn't rule out CTIF. So very important test and it can differentiate between pulmonary arterial hypertension and CTIF. The importance of that test is CTIF is the only pulmonary hypertension that is curable. So if you do a VQ scan and it is high probability, you can proceed uh, to uh, pulmonary angiography and eventually treatment. This is the query study and only 64% of academic centers and 48% of community hospitals performed C, uh, VQ scan as part of evaluation of pulmonary arterial hypertension throughout CTIF. This is a simple test that can lead to cure. This is a patient with CTIF. You can see a perfusion uh, mismatch in multiple areas, mainly right middle lobe and uh, left lower lobe. And the patient underwent angiography and you can see this is perfusion of the right lung. There is a decreased perfusion here in, in that area. And on the left uh, side, there is decreased perfusion in the left uh, lower lobe. Uh, after we do uh, pulmonary angiography, we uh, evaluate patient for uh, uh, surgery. And this is one of our patients underwent surgery for CTIF. She was 27. She was on multiple medication, functional class 4, low cardiac index, parenteral therapy. She underwent surgery. She's off treatment, mean pulmonary artery pressure normal. We see her every year just for follow-up. But you can see the extent of clot, and it is not clot. It's organized uh, fibrous tissue, which is, looks like a cast filling the pulmonary uh, artery. So this is to highlight the importance of VQ scan in your workup of a case of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Then right heart cath. This is the normal waveform you will get. Right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery. Uh, with increase in the diastolic uh, pressure, and eventually you go into uh, which uh, location. Uh, we will highlight uh, quick points in the right heart cath, including the catheter course, uh, interpretation of pulmonary artery wedge pressure, uh, touch base about saturation, QPQS vasoactivity. QPQS is basically pulmonary to systemic flow. Usually it should be one. Your pulmonary systemic flow should be equal. Uh, if you have a shunt from left uh, to right, uh, your QPQS will be higher because of the amount of blood shifted from the left side to the right side. If you start developing Eisenmenger syndrome with reverse, reversal of flow from right to left side, your QPQS will be less than one. So it is basically a measurement of the flow in the pulmonary and systemic uh, circulation. Doing the right heart cath can be a straightforward procedure. You go from the right femoral vein, advance your catheter, IVC, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and which. But sometimes you may have uh, uh, tricky cases. This was a patient uh, who was 61 year old, presented for us. We did right heart cath. We advanced the catheter. Every time we advance the catheter, it crossed the midline. When the catheter crossed the midlines, it means you are in artery and you have to make sure you uh, evaluate your axis again. And, but this patient, every time we are sure we are in the venous circulation, every time the catheter crossed to the left side, we got venous sample, we were in the vein, we got uh, tracing, we were in, in the venous system. We advanced the catheter, and you can see the bizarre course uh, uh, it took. We were able to identify different uh, locations uh, or different uh, right atrium, right ventricle, just by the tracing uh, during the right heart cath. We performed it 3D with... Uh, uh, 3D reconstruction of a CAT scan, and she was found to have hemiozygous continuation of inferior vena cava. Uh, so the catheter went to the hemiozygous vein, and then she had the left superior vena cava, so the catheter curved through the superior vena cava, and eventually to the right atrium, right ventricle, and to the pulmonary artery. This patient was 61, was never diagnosed. This was the first heart cath. So it, it can uh, reveal uh, some uh, unknown uh, diagnosis. Widget pressure. 
very important to take uh, the wedge pressure at end uh, expiratory uh, pressure. You can see the difference between the digital reported pressure on the screen and the end expiratory pressure. This is a patient presented, and she presented with uh, the CAT uh, report, which reported wedge pressure as nine. So looking at the numbers, you will classify it as group one, normal wedge pressure. But we always look at tracing. If you look at the tracing, the actual pulmonary uh, wedge pressure at the end expiration is 20. Uh, so this is clearly group two. You don't treat it with pulmonary artery vasodilator therapy. And this is a study uh, uh, proving that uh, using the digital reported wedge pressure uh, can actually underestimate your uh, uh, wedge pressure. And it can misclassify 27% of patients having diastolic dysfunction as PAH patients. So very important to uh, uh, have careful uh, look at uh, the tracing not only the location of the tracing, but also the waveform. This is a patient presented with shortness of breath. This is a wedge position. There is increase in the wedge pressure, but not only the pressure is increased, you notice there is increased V wave in wedge position. In that case, as you think about mitral regerg, for example, but this guy didn't have mitral regerg. Uh, he had history of uh, uh, ablation for AFib. So you think about pulmonary venous stenosis. CT showed no uh, pulmonary venous stenosis. And that by definition is stiff left atrium. So if you have normal uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, elevated left atrial pressure, which you can indirectly measure by wedge uh, pressure, and a history of uh, recent uh, or old ablation uh, with absence of mitral valve pathology and pulmonary venous stenosis, you might have left atrial uh, syndrome. Uh, so this is just highlight the importance of paying attention not only to uh, uh, the location and the catheter course, uh, but also to different wave uh, forms in different uh, locations. We will present few cases just to highlight the importance of measuring saturation, measuring QB, uh, QS uh, uh, in congenital uh, cases. Uh, this patient presented with shortness of breath and RV enlargement. Uh, we performed a dry heart cat and the pressures were normal, but uh, we found increased uh, in saturation in superior vena cava. We performed CT scan and she had anomalous pulmonary venous return on the left. And uh, you can see uh, the left veins form the left vert vertical vein uh, basically emptying into uh, the left uh, innominate uh, vein. She only had one small pulmonary vein from uh, the left lower lobe training in the right side, uh, in the right location, which is the left atrium. The patient underwent uh, surgery and is now asymptomatic, the RV recovered with normal size. You can see QPQS is 1.9, above one. So there is significant shunt from left to right. You don't see these cases only in young age, but you can see it in older age. This is a patient presented with evaluation and she had a normal right heart cath before. We didn't have saturation on that heart cath was performed before in outside facility. We repeated her right heart cath and also there was increase in saturation in the superior vena cava. It was typical to see congenital presentation in that age, but still you can see it. Uh, and this is uh, our catheter uh, uh, when we performed the right heart cath. We were able to engage the tip of the catheter at the entrance uh, of the right upper pulmonary vein and saturation here was about uh, 96%. Uh, uh, she had uh, shunt from left to right. Your QPQS is 1.4. We did a CT scan and she had a partial anomalous pulmonary venous uh, return with the right upper pulmonary uh, vein draining into superior vena cava. So this is superior vena cava. This is the right upper pulmonary uh, vein. Due to age, multiple comorbidities, she didn't want to have surgery and we are just monitoring her symptoms and she's receiving uh, diuretics. The reason we present these cases and then following with this case, just to highlight what can happen if you don't uh, treat these patients early and correct this shunt. Uh, this is another patient we have. She has anomalous pulmonary venous return, but multiple veins draining into different location, four anomalous veins draining at three different locations. She has shunt, which was high, but was not corrected, was not diagnosed. Eventually, you have reversal of the shunt and increase in pulmonary artery pressure. And that's what happened in this case. And eventually, now she has Eisenmenger syndrome. She has severe pulmonary hypertension, QPQS less than one. So again, you have shunt reversal from right to left due to severe pulmonary hypertension, which is Eisenmenger syndrome. This is a, a, a 
a cut from her echo. You can see right ventricular enlargement, small left uh, ventricle. She had multiple uh, areas of anomalous pulmonary venous repair. She is on maximal vasodilator therapy, and she is on the lung transplant list. If that was diagnosed earlier, much earlier, before development of pulmonary hypertension, she could have went for surgery with correction uh, uh, of uh, those uh, anomalous veins. Treatment of, of uh, cardiac defect in setting of pulmonary hypertension can be uh, tricky, and, and this case highlights this uh, concept. This is a patient that uh, went to outside facility, had an echo, showed increased right ventricular systolic pressure, underwent right heart care, confirmed pulmonary hypertension. Uh, then the decision was made to close the ASD. She had an ASD. Uh, they placed a plaster device which closed the ASD. And after the procedure, the patient had increased hypoxia, uh, increased shortness of breath, and repeat echo showed worsening uh, of the right ventricle, right ventricular failure, right ventricular dilation, and she was transferred to our hospital. Looking at the previous cath number, she had Eisenmenger syndrome with QPQS less than one. So it is a contraindication to close uh, uh, your ASD in that setting. And patient can have worse mortality if you close that ASD. So that, that is the implantser device uh, uh, was taken out, so it was removed, and the patient was started on pulmonary artery vasodilator therapy. We see her in clinic, she's functional class two, she's doing fine with the ASD open uh, because she had Eisenmenger syndrome, which at the beginning, it was a contraindication for that shunt uh, closure. But if you do close the shunt in the right uh, circumstances, that can uh, 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 have better outcomes. Uh, this is another example of our patient presented to us, young uh, female. You can see marked cardiomegaly uh, 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 on that image, enlargement of the pulmonary artery. Look at that right ventricle in comparison to the left ventricle. Huge left, a uh, huge right ventricle, uh, almost single atrium. You, you don't see a, a, a septum here between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Uh, you can see marked uh, reflux of contrast into the hepatic vein with uh, enlargement. We performed a right heart cath during the right heart cath as expected. Uh, saturation was elevated in, in the uh, right uh, atrium, and she didn't have pulmonary hypertension. And those are um, the echoes before uh, uh, the treatment. Uh, so you can see uh, right ventricular enlargement, and you can see the atria, almost single atrium uh, here. Uh, she underwent uh, surgery. Of course, QPQS, very high. She has large shunt from left to uh, right. She underwent surgery with uh, closure. And you can see here with uh, saline contrast injected to the right side, not uh, crossing uh, to the left, uh, telling you that that septum is closed. Uh, the right ventricle can recover. It can take different uh, time and period of time. This patient had right ventricular strain and enlargement for 29 years. So it may take longer than the expected to recover. We are following here in our clinic. The most recent echo uh, uh, showed some uh, 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 reverse remodeling of the right ventricle, which started to become smaller. Symptoms uh, completely recovered after uh, surgery. Moving to uh, vasoreactivity testing. Uh, during the right heart cath, we uh, test if the patients are vasoreactive or uh, not by uh, giving inhaled nitric uh, oxide to see and identify that group of patients that can benefit from calcium channel blocker uh, treatment. Uh, the definition of vasoreactivity test is important to know because a lot of time it's, it's mislabeled or uh, not remembered. Uh, your mean pulmonary artery pressures should drop by more than 10 points to a number less than 40 with preserved or uh, increased cardiac output. So if your mean pulmonary artery pressure is 60 and you give inhaled nitric oxide and your mean pulmonary artery pressure drops to 50, your number still is not below 40. So that's not a true positive vasoreactivity uh, test. If that patient is vasoreactive and you decide to treat with calcium channel blocker, you have to be very careful with closed monitoring. A lot of those patients lose their vasoreactivity in the first year of treatment. Uh, so you have to be very careful. And it can be tricky because starting some calcium channel blocker, such as amlodipine, can cause lower extremity edema. So you can start the treatment. The patient comes to your clinic. 
we still have shortness of breath, we have lower extremity edema, and it can be tricky to know if the patient is improving or if the patient is progressing actually and developing right heart failure. Very dangerous to continue the calcium channel blocker if the patient lose vascular activity because what you are doing now is you are suppressing that right ventricle uh, more. Uh, general recommendation for pulmonary hypertension, we recommend to avoid uh, pregnancy. Uh, you take your general uh, uh, recommended uh, immunization, uh, supervised uh, exercise testing or rehab is advised uh, with avoidance of excessive uh, uh, exertion. Uh, oxygen, uh, if you uh, fly, if we think you need oxygen. Uh, very important surgery. If you do any elective surgery, uh, it is preferred to have local uh, nerve block better than uh, epidural anesthesia or spinal anesthesia and definitely better than uh, general anesthesia. What can happen with general anesthesia or trying to intubate a patient with pulmonary hypertension, the patient can die. And this is an interesting case. I like it because it has a, a continuous monitoring of the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the mean arterial uh, pressure. Look at that mean pulmonary artery pressure, about 85, and the mean systemic pressure. You start giving sedation and you try to intubate the patient and eventually your mean pulmonary artery pressure cross your mean systemic pressure, no flow, cardiac arrest. And that's what happened in a pulmonary hypertension patient. You might have patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, you try to do a conscious sedation, or you try to do intubation, the patient has cardiac arrest. That, that's what happens. If you lower your systolic uh, blood uh, pressure, the mean systo uh, systolic blood pressure, and eventually your mean pulmonary artery uh, uh, pressure becomes higher than the mean uh, systemic pressure, you have no flow, and the patient can uh, arrest. In this case, here they did PEE during the procedure, and you can see uh, the right ventricle before the procedure was maintaining the function, and the patient had uh, a good size right ventricle and good size uh, cardiac output. But during the procedure, with that increase in uh, pulmonary artery uh, uh, pressure, you can see RV failure and RV dilation on the PEE with septal shift, which can also decrease your cardiac uh, output more, and it's a vicious uh, circle. Supportive therapy, uh, diuretic treatment, uh, oxygen uh, uh, with evaluation as needed, uh, oral anticoagulation, not for everyone, but uh, in specific situation, you may start anticoagulation in uh, pulmonary hypertension in specific uh, subgroup, uh, idiopathic, hereditary, and uh, uh, pH uh, due to uh, drugs and uh, toxins. Uh, try to avoid beta blocker or calcium channel blocker that can directly suppress uh, the right ventricular uh, function in patients who are not vasoreactive. We confirm diagnosis of pulmonary uh, hypertension. If the patient uh, has uh, one of these categories, we test for vasoreactivity. If they are vasoreactive, we treat with calcium channel blocker. If they are not vasoreactive, we evaluate for starting uh, therapy. Uh, there is more shift now or, uh, with starting combination uh, therapy. And if the patient has advanced functional class, a lot of time we admit the patient to the hospital, start parenteral uh, therapy uh, uh, right away and you can add therapy uh, on, and eventually if there is no response, lung transplantation can be considered, but we, we rarely need to refer patients for lung transplantation with all of the medications uh, uh, we have right now, but if the patient doesn't respond and he's a candidate, we, we do the referral. Initiation of, ther uh, of therapy. Uh, this is representing the most uh, recent paradigm in treatment. Most of our patients are on combination therapy, including parenteral uh, uh, treatment if they are advanced. Uh, looking at our patients uh, here, 85% of our patients are on combination therapy, which reflect this figure. 30% uh, of our patients are on parenteral uh, therapy, which is consistent with what we are seeing uh, here. Since 1995, uh, development of EPO, uh, Multiple medications uh, uh, have uh, evolved and uh, are in the market and approved for treatment of uh, pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension. Those medications uh, either target, again, the prostacycline pathway, endothelial receptor pathway, or the nitric oxide pathway. Uh, EPO, uh, Flolan, Velitri. Velitri is more stable at room uh, temperature. Both of them, they have a short half-life. Uh, Triprostinib, uh, the IV or sub-Q, they have longer half-life. 
uh, when compared uh, to uh, EPO. Uh, three prostinil uh, had uh, a sub-Q uh, formulation. IV uh, uh, can be given IV as well. Uh, inhaled, which is divaso, oral, uh, which is ornitram. Uh, Eloprost is another medicine which is uh, inhaled. Silixibag is a recently approved uh, medicine. Abtravi, which is oral prostacycline uh, uh, agonist. Uh, it's taken twice daily and titrated to the maximum tolerated uh, uh, dose. Uh, in the therian receptor uh, um, antagonist, you have ambrosentan, mesentan, and bosentan. Bosentan require uh, 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 liver uh, function test every month to evaluate for liver function. You don't need to do that with mesentan and ambrosentan. Uh, PDE5 uh, inhibitor, sildenafil and tadalafil, which is the longer acting. And finally, riosiguat, which was approved. And this is the only medicine uh, approved now for treatment of uh, CTEF. Uh, Merit one study was just completed and published, and it showed positive outcome using mesitentin with uh, CTIF uh, patients, but uh, this is not uh, FDA approved uh, until this uh, moment. We have different devices to uh, deliver our medications. Uh, if you choose to uh, use sub-Q medication, this is uh, the pump for sub-Q. This is IV pump. This is a Tyveso uh, uh, inhaled uh, device. Uh, this is Ventavis uh, inhale inhalation uh, system. Uh, very important when you give parenteral therapy, this line has to be a dedicated line, no flushing, no lab drawing from this line. If it is a pick line, uh, you have to preload medicine and prime the line before starting the medicine because it has few millimeter. Uh, it has to have the medicine in, so you don't have any interruption of medicine. So if you are switching the lines and switching the medicine, the nurse has to be trained, and that's why we admit all of our patients to a specific floor in Jewish hospital because the nurses are trained and they know how to prime the line. Because it can be tricky switching sub-Q to IV if you don't uh, do the correct uh, priming uh, of uh, the line. We follow our patients with EKG, echo, uh, six-minute walk test, uh, right heart cath, and uh, blood uh, work. And very important to know that progression of pulmonary hypertension can happen, and we can see that on echo and right heart cath before they have the clinical presentation. So this is a study followed PH patient for 10 years, and you can see the difference here, uh, uh, separation of the lines on the echo before the clinical separation. So a six-minute walk test, relatively stable. Uh, you look at patients with favorable versus unfavorable outcome. They had a similar functional class with some separation at the end, but look at separation of the lines here earlier. That's why we do repeated echoes trying to catch those patients who are at high risk of progression even before they complain with reduced six-minute walk test or going into frank right ventricular uh, failure. There is no such patient as stable in pulmonary hypertension. Patient, uh, you don't start one or two medications and you just tell the patient I'll see you once a year or six months. Uh, this is a patient we have been following since 2011, and you can see the fluctuation in pressure and chemodynamics and change of medications over uh, years. I, I put here the cardiac output and PVR because I said only the mean pulmonary artery pressure doesn't mean anything, uh, but here you can see, you know, her mean pulmonary artery pressure went to 14 and increased to 44. We were able to treat her, went down to 27 with good preserved cardiac output. And it is a, con a continuous process. You have to evaluate the patient, re-evaluate the patient, risk assess the patient every time they come to your office, and adjust medication uh, to uh, uh, help them to uh, improve. Prognosis of pulmonary hypertension, it is better than the reported in, in NIH uh, registry, but it is uh, still fatal uh, disease with a poor uh, outcome. We use, uh, we use different uh, diagnostic and risk assessment uh, tools for prognosis. Uh, one of the risk assessment tool is uh, a reveal uh, registry risk uh, calculator, and it can give you a number and it can predict uh, uh, your one-year uh, outcome. It's very important to try to target low risk status or lower your score, because if I change you from a high risk to low risk, that will translate into better survival. So look at those patients with decreased risk score versus patients with increased risk score. So it is not only the risk score you do at visit one, but if you are able to treat the patient and move uh, the risk score from a high risk score to a lower risk score, that will translate into better outcome. This is the risk assessment tool, the European one, and this table basically has three things. Number one, symptoms and functional class. Number two, exercise capacity. 
And number three is right ventricular uh, function. Uh, patients do not present with low risk, intermediate, or high risk. They always have a mix between low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, which looks like a Rubik's Cube. And you try to align the low risk uh, 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 responses from the patient and trying to move each uh, category from a high risk to a low risk uh, uh, group. And that will translate eventually in better uh, outcome. And, and this theory was tested in the last year with three different registries uh, published last year uh, from the Swedish registry, COMPARA study, and French uh, study, trying to risk stratify patients by that table we saw, low, intermediate, or high risk. And you can see the difference in outcome. If you, are, if you have the same disease, same diagnosis, but you have different risk category, you have different outcome. So uh, labeling everyone as poor prognosis or giving the patient a fixed number is, is not right. You have to risk stratify each patient and re-stratify again after treatment. You can see the difference between 85% versus 35%. That's a big difference. So you have to stratify and repeat your risk uh, stratification. What they did here is uh, if you are a low risk, they give you one point, intermediate risk, two point, high risk, three points. Mm -hmm. They added the number, they took the median, calculated the risk, and uh, 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 classified patients to low, moderate, high risk. This is different from the French study. They looked at risk criteria. So if you have zero low risk criteria, your mortality, uh, uh, your outcome is worse. If you have four low risk criteria, you have better uh, outcome. The French study used a different approach, but all of these studies looked at the same uh, table we just looked at. And finally, paradigm shifts in uh, design of clinical trial of pulmonary hypertension. It, initially, we had no trials. Then we started having trials, monotherapy versus placebo, short uh, trials, low number, six-minute walk test was a primary endpoint. The most recent clinical trials, mainly seraphine, Griffin, and Ambition, they included higher number. They compared combination versus monotherapy. They included more patients. They followed patients for a longer period of time, which is reasonable to know what's your outcome. It's not enough to follow patients for 12 weeks. So they followed patients for a longer period of time, up to more than 100 uh, weeks. They used different outcome. Six minutes walk test shouldn't be the main and only primary outcome. Uh, they used time to clinical worsening, uh, time to uh, initiation uh, of parenteral therapy, time of lung transplant, which is clinically relevant. Looking at, at the table we saw, it, it will be important also to design a clinical trial using low risk as end point. If I'm able to move you from a high risk group to a low risk group, and I'm sure this will lead to a better outcome and less mortality, that should be uh, one of the clinical end points for clinical trial. Recruiting everyone, randomize the patient, and see with that therapy, are you able to achieve a higher percentage of low risk status uh, in patients, which will be very uh, uh, relevant in our practice. New treatments for pulmonary hypertension are under investigation. Uh, again, as I mentioned, all of the medications, about 13 medications in the market target only three pathways, but there are more in the pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension, more than only those uh, three uh, pathways. Uh, there are clinical studies looking at growth factors TGF beta, vasoactive mediators, mitochondrial metabolism, inflammation, calcium uh, signaling. And uh, hopefully, we will have more uh, uh, treatments for uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension uh, in the following years. So, our key points here uh, pulmonary hypertension is defined by increased mean pulmonary artery pressure above 25 millimeter mercury. We have five types or subgroups of pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, group 1, which is called PAH, has increased pressure, increased vascular resistance with normal wedge uh, pressure. Uh, it is very important to do your work up to narrow your diagnosis to PAH and then do further work up to subclassify groups of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Don't forget VQ scan to evaluate for CTEF for every patient presenting for evaluation of pulmonary hypertension. The gold standard of diagnosis is right heart cath. We cannot start the treatment without performing right heart cath to evaluate our numbers and uh, group uh, our pH into one of those five different uh, groups. 
uh, calcium channel blocker is not for everyone. It can be harmful if you don't have vasoactivity uh, test. So don't start calcium channel blocker on anyone presenting with uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. Early referral is important. Early treatment is important. It, it can make a big difference. Remember those pathophysiological uh, uh, changes and the pathology slides. If you are too late, I can start you on treatment, you will not have a good uh, response. If all of those uh, vascular uh, remodeling changes happened and your pulmonary vasculature already occluded, you have plexiform lesion, necrotizing arthritis, treatment may be uh, uh, too late uh, in th at that point of uh, time. You can use any combination, but remember, don't use Biosiguat with PDA5 inhibitor uh, or uh, any nitric uh, or nitrate compound because that can precipitate uh, severe uh, uh, hypotension. So just be familiar with this medicine because it can be relatively new. And remember, it is contraindicated uh, combination. And finally, uh, you aim uh, to move your patients from high risk or intermediate risks to a low risk status. This is one of our uh, patients. She came uh, to me two years ago. Uh, she was referred initially for lung transplant uh, evaluation. She wasn't maximized on treatment. Uh, we repeated her heart care. We adjusted her therapy. And uh, when she came to me, RV was dilated, hypokinetic. She wasn't able to walk from the parking lot to the office. And she showed me this picture in the last clinic visit. She told me I was doing gardening. I thought about uh, less intense work, <laughs> but that's what she was doing. And uh, that, that highlights uh, uh, what you can do with treatment and uh, how you can achieve low uh, functional, uh, uh, low risk status with better functional class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, John Wells Kirsch, for really a very comprehensive review um, and a tremendous update. It's, it's an interesting question, but uh, it, it could be. It could be. Yeah. So the enlargement of the right stem cell itself, the mechanical factors on the wall of the patient, the patient will leave inside open. I would tell you in all of the cells, about one to three to right. three. So it, it, you, you move from uh, grade one to class four. Uh, when you have ad advancement of the disease, it may be irreversible. Those irreversible changes are the changes in the pulmonary vasculature. The vasculature, yes, yes. And, uh, the right ventricle, if, if you are able to reduce that after load, uh, you can have marked right ventricular uh, remodeling. And that data came initially when you have advanced uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, they used to do uh, combined heart and lung transplantation, thinking that the right ventricle is, is dead and it will not recover. Uh, the data from CTIF uh, treatment, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, patient goes, you take these clots out, and they found patients with advanced right ventricular disease, they recover and the right ventricle shrink and becomes normal. Uh, and they extrapolated this data to uh, transplantation. So now when you have someone with pulmonary hypertension with poor function of the right ventricle, you do lung, lung transplant, you reduce uh, the PVR, the right ventricle start to improve. Sometimes if your right ventricle function is, is very uh, 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 affected and you have low cardiac index, sometimes you may do the lung transplant, you use ECMO for bridge till right ventricular uh, recovery happen, and then you can decannulate them and eventually right ventricle uh, can uh, return back to normal.
Okay, thank you.